So I'm actually going to give a little bit of a preface to the presentation, and then Heather will give the most, uh, the bulk of the presentation. Uh, but I wanted, to, there we go, to talk about the data that we used. So this is a secondary analysis of data that was collected by Robert Williams uh, in the Quinty Longitudinal Study. And we all know how expensive and time consuming it is to collect, uh, particularly this high quality longitudinal data. So it's very efficient and just generally a great idea to make use of this data for multiple purposes. So I wanted to tell you about a resource that we're pretty proud of at the Gambling Research Exchange Ontario. So we are in Ontario, Canada, and we're in Guelph, which is about an hour west of Toronto, if that helps you locate. But you don't need to locate us because you can just go to our website, which is greo.ca. And at our website, among other great resources, we have a data repository. And in that data repository, we have many data sets that were funded when we used to be OPGRC and funded research. Now we work on knowledge translation. But in addition to about the 12 data sets that we have that include the Quinty Longitudinal Study, we also have links to external data sets. So we link to data sets in the UK. We link to the Australian Data Archive. We link to Howard Schaefer's data in the US. Now, if you go through to those repositories, you follow the rules and protocols of those repositories. This is sort of a way to pull them all together. If you use our data, uh, then there's a little request form that you fill in so that you know how the data is going to be used. So it, the reason I tell you that is because we use that data, we carefully archive it, we preserve it, and we carefully grant access. So if you have data that you would like to be used for other purposes, I would very much encourage you to contact me or another data repository. And if you would like to access data, you can do it through here and you can look at the data set and investigate the supporting materials like the code books to find out if it has the variables that you'd like to use. So that's our little plug for the repository and I hope you will explore it and find it useful. Uh, and now Heather will tell you about the study that uh, she conducted using this data. Okay, thank you. Okay, so the, this study really grew out of some research I did with youth. That's my main area of research. And when I was looking and understanding more about youth and sexual orientation, I discovered Yes, there seems to be much higher uh, incidence of risk-taking behavior uh, in youth that centers around uh, sexual orientation. It might be that perhaps it's part of that identity development phase that is very much the focus of adolescence, if you believe in Erickson and uh, his theories. But maybe it's something that's a little bit more. And yes, there was a lot of research a fair bit of research that pointed out this connection that those with uh, sexual orientations in the minority engaged in more risk-taking behavior. I couldn't find studies that really talked about what's it like in adulthood. Is this just a function of adolescence or is there something more? So luckily this data set was available and I was able then to replicate my youth study to uh, take a look at this in uh, adulthood. So as Trudy mentioned, it is secondary data analysis. We use the Quinty longitudinal study that was completed in Ontario, Canada, and Dr. Williams and Dr. Hahn are the PIs, and Dr. Williams has talked about uh, this study at different points in this conference over the, over the years, so you may have uh, some exposure to that. Uh, it is a longitudinal study collecting data over five years. They only asked the question around sexual orientation in the first wave of the data. So because they're trying to find out, well, is this an issue at all, I only examined the uh, first wave of the data. Future studies, I'll keep going as you'll see. So there were 4,120 individuals that were part of this study using MANOVA, ANOVA, and TUKIs to really examine group differences. The measures 
around sexual orientation, and I used uh, the exact phrasing that was used in the questionnaire. Heterosexual, i.e. straight, bisexual, homosexual, i.e. gay, prefer not to say. They also looked at lifetime participation in illegal activity. There were 13 activities that were listed. Assault, breaking and entering, shoplifting, so many of the activities, pretty standard what you see in most questionnaires that are looking at uh, illegal ac activities. And also a question around past 12 months substance use. Nine substances were inquired about, alcohol, cannabis, to, uh, tobacco, amphetamines. And with respect to gambling, questions were asked around the activities that they participated in, do you do and they had a list of many activities, how often they participated in these activities, and the CPGI, CP, I always trip over it, thank you. Uh, they, uh, the, the, all those questions were there, so we were able to determine scores. And these are the results. With the groupings, as one would expect, the majority, almost 96%, identified as heterosexual. 1.5% identified as bisexual, 1% identified as homosexual, and 1.8% identified as prefer not to talk about it. And I'm going to talk about that uh, category in a minute. In Canada, uh, looking at a similar age group to what this study uh, has, very similar findings in terms of sexual orientation. So what we found in the Quinty really is very representative of what we see within Canada. And the data that were collected in the, in, this, in the Quinty area in Ontario, again, if you look at the census data for Canada, is very representative of what Canada looks like. This one question about, well, or I answer possibility about, um, prefer not to answer, there's some potential methodological problems with that because why is that? Is it that they don't feel that they fit into the other classifications, the other options? In today's research on sexual orientation, sexual orientation is considered more of a continuum. It's fluid. People move along it, so they may not identify in any one particular category. It may be that they don't feel comfortable disclosing their orientation or that they may not have made it public. So they don't want to put it down on a questionnaire because it's a longitudinal study and they can find, the researchers would be able to follow them and they'll know who you are and I wouldn't want people to know it, I haven't disclosed it. So the possibility, maybe that they haven't accepted their orientation. Or it may be that they feel the information is private and shouldn't be disclosed anywhere. Like this is none of your business. I'm sure there, you could think of some other possibilities, but what it really says is we have to interpret findings with caution around this particular group. So with respect to the illegal activities, we want to remember that the question says, have you ever done these in your lifetime? Of the 13, uh, there were four that came up as significant. Theft, uh, the bracketed uh, section, that's referring to the order for which uh, frequently, uh, the number of people that were within the groups that were reporting engaging in those activities, that particular activity. So the lowest level of engagement was the preferred not to say group, whereas the highest was the homosexual group in terms of frequency. Where the exact differences lay among the four groups was between the heterosexual and bisexual group, between heterosexual and homosexual, and between homosexual and the preferred not to say. I bolded the higher frequency. In terms of sexual assault, so perpetration of, of sexual assault, lowest were the heterosexual, highest were homosexual, and certainly within the adolescent literature, uh, Dank and colleagues in 2013 explored 
uh, sexual orientation and dating violence and, and others have been looked at this as well and they're finding that there are heightened uh, risks that they will experience violence. Well, if you think if they're experiencing it, who's the one that is uh, perhaps uh, engaging, being the doer, uh, the perpetrator of the sexual assault? If they've identified as a particular group, then it suggests that it would be somebody from within the group that is then uh, perpetrating the, the assault. So heterosexual was the lowest, homosexual was the highest. The difference, heterosexual and homosexual, bisexual and homosexual, and homosexual and uh, prefer not to say. Again, I've bolded the three areas. With respect to shoplifting, lowest is preferred not to say, highest is bisexual. Differences lay with heterosexual and bisexual, and bisexual and preferred not to say. While fraud and embezzlement did come up overall as significant, when I looked at the group differences closer, there were no significant group differences. So what is this really telling us? With the exception of shoplifting, homosexuals followed by bisexuals reported engaging in illegal activities the most among the four groups. When you look at what they're engaging in and the frequency of those uh, behaviors, some of them are common behaviors excluding uh, perhaps the sexual assault, although sexual assault in youth is quite high, especially around sexual minorities. It could be an adolescent phenomena because we asked, the question that was asked was, has this, have you done this in your lifetime? So it could have been all part of adolescent development, adolescent exploration that's occurring. We don't know when this happened. So we have to uh, be a little bit cautioned, cautious of determining or taking the interpretation too far. And there may be some other reasons. Why are we seeing theft, shoplifting, and um, sexual assault as much higher? We'll see that there are some relation to increase uh, in risk-taking risk associated with substance abuse, uh, substance use, and gambling. So are those behaviors then in conjunction with or as a result of having higher engagement in gambling, for example, you're stealing or shoplifting uh, to fund their gambling habit. Something that I'll be exploring a little bit different, uh, a little bit more as we move on. So in terms of substance abuse or substance use, tobacco was significant. Heterosexuals were the lowest frequency, bisexuals were, had the highest frequency of use. The only difference, statistically different, uh, significant difference, was with heterosexual and bisexuals, bisexuals reporting the most. With cannabis, homosexual being the lowest, bisexual being the highest frequencies. Heterosexual and bisexual, bisexual and homosexual were the only group differences that were significant. In terms of inhalants, the heterosexual, homosexual, and preferred not to answer had the same uh, scores in terms of frequency. Bisexual was um, much higher. So the differences lay between heterosexual and bisexual, heter uh, bisexual and homosexual, bisexual and preferred not to say, which makes sense when you look at uh, the frequencies. And the fourth area was around opiates, where homosexuals were the lowest, bisexuals were the highest reporting of engagement. Key differences are between the heterosexual and the bisexual groups, and the bisexual and the homosexual groups. So what is this really telling us? Those that identify as bisexual consistently engage in the greatest amount of substance use, that's consist, exactly consistent with the finding I had with an adolescent population, identical. It was the bisexuals that were engaging most frequently uh, across the board. And I actually looked at uh, 10 different risk behaviors, consistent across the 10. 
perhaps that it might be a form of coping and feeling that, well, if I'm uh, engaging in some of these behaviors with a peer group, I might be more included if they haven't come to terms with their sexuality. Uh, it, within the bisexual community, there is sometimes a feeling like you don't fit anywhere. So they've been reporting where I'm not part of the homosexual group because I also am interested in a heterosexual relationship, but the heterosexual community says, well, wait, you sometimes are interested in same-sex relationships, so they don't feel that they're really fitting in anywhere. So that could be, uh, we know that substance use and, and other risk-taking behaviors are sometimes a function of uh, coping. It could be something there. The bisexual and the preferred not to say groups, they may view themselves as part of a counterculture. And they may be participating in activities that are considered outside of normative substance use. So the inhalants, for example, you don't typically see adults engaging in inhalants. That's something that happens in youth. But they're engaging in inhalants, they're engaging in um, the uh, opiate use that at higher levels than what we see with the heterosexual community, possibly speculating, that's the best I can, can do in trying to understand more about these findings. Then in terms of gambling activity participation, overall there was a significance in uh, each of these three areas that I examined. N uh, the number of gambling activities participated in, heterosexual uh, grouping engaged in the fewest, bisexual engaged in the greatest number, but there was no significant difference among the groups. Overall, the number of days found a significant difference about the groups. However, when I looked at it closer, no difference. And the same thing with the number of days in the past year. And when we looked at CPGI score of greater than five, so in the problem gambling category, the heterosexuals had the fewest number of people in that category. The people that preferred not to say were in the highest, and that's where we saw the greatest difference and a significant difference between those group groupings. So what does this tell us about problem gambling and sexual orientation? It's interesting because we didn't find any difference in terms of the number of activities they're engaging in, the frequency of, their, of what they're engaging in on a monthly or yearly basis, so what could be going on? Maybe it's about the amount of money they spend, maybe it's something about the way they engage in those uh, activities or the reason behind the engagement in those activities. Still trying to sort that one out. And that's something that uh, we'll be looking at closer in the next phase of this study, trying to understand more about, well, what's contributing to these findings? Why is it that uh, we're seeing higher in the minority sexual orientation groups? So, in conclusion, these findings were really consistent with what is found and what is shown in the sexual or the adolescent research. So what's going on? In adulthood, you should have a defined, if we go by the theories, it's expected that we have a defined sense of self, we have a, a defined identity, our sexual identity, our gender identity. We should have figured that out as adults. So maybe the risk taking that was engaged in adolescence wasn't part of the identity exploration for uh, people that have, uh, have chosen to identify or I, I do identify with uh, minority sexual orientations. Maybe there's just something else that's going on. Is it that their sexual identity isn't formed yet in uh, adulthood? Is it that there are extraneous factors for individuals uh, that have minority sexual orientations that come into play? Not sure. So that's why the next steps are to take a look at the longitudinal data now that we've established that there, there are similar findings. It's not just a phenomena of adolescence. So take a look at the risk taking across the five year period. 
Do we see similar findings when we look at the whole population? Dr. Williams has talked about how uh, the gamblers and engagement in problem gambling goes in and out over time. Will we see similar patterns when we now look at sexual orientation? And try to understand more about some of these extraneous factors that might be playing a role in the development of problem gambling. Could be something about family environment, could be an underlying mental health condition, something else that might be going on and contributing that sexual orientation has nothing to do with this engagement in higher risk-taking behaviors. So more to come. It's the first stage of uh, the research so that we were able to at least establish whether this was an issue or not. And uh, hopefully we'll be able to report uh, much greater detail of the findings uh, next in two years. No, I just presented the ones that were significant. Yeah, where I found significant differences. The one when um, I didn't present them is because they didn't come up as, okay. as having significant differences among the groups. So alcohol, there was no difference. They were all drinking the same amount of alcohol. Uh, so, you know, I was just highlighting the differences. Okay. Yeah. risk-taking, and um, there was something in your presentation, Joanna, that talked about, um, um, I'm trying to remember exactly the wording now, um, females were escape gamblers and males were risk-taking gamblers, action. action gamblers, and that was certainly, that's certainly been our exper experience in corrections, that difference between a women's prison and a men's prison, gambling is night and day. Um, and so I was just interested in the risk-taking aspect of that, whether the types of gambling were, um, in, in your case, whether that had any, for you, the population in particular, whether the types of gambling had any impact. The challenge is that the cells get so small that if you break it out looking at uh, sex differences, I, I can't really say anything because the cells just get too small. And what about correlation with other high-risk-taking drug drugs like? Um, Correlation-wise, uh, there doesn't seem to be a difference with males and females, at least in the two studies that uh, that I've done. So correlation-wise, the the significant like it's it's similar with males and females. I don't know if you've found the same in any studies that you've done. In correlation, so with females and correlating with uh, alcohol use, yes, or, yes. is it similar yes. to males? Uh, Do you find that? No, but I haven't studied really oh, okay. any yet. So, uh, but uh, yes, there was drinking, or they talked about drinking in their families, or in a couple, or uh, right. so. Yeah, where, where do you um, classify yourself? That's yeah. the only sexual identity question that was uh, asked within this study. 
so I can't add any. The study is completed, so I'm, it's secondary data. So it's you know the challenge of secondary data. That would be a great follow-up in terms of another study that yeah. can delve That's much study. deeper into it. Love to do that. Yeah. <laughs> Love to be able to do that. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you.